All right, so here we go. Big Daddy and Friends. Like I always say, I try to bring uh, the people on to the show that have been there, done it, have been in the game, have been on the field, have had their feet in the sand. So our next guest, he's definitely done that and then some. So everyone here at Big Daddy and Friends, all our fans and viewers, listeners, let's say hello to Mark Dominic. What's up, Mark? How you doing, man? I'm good, good, Big Daddy. It's nice to be on with you. I appreciate being part of the family. Yeah, absolutely, man. You know, we got to uh, spread the love and share our world, you know, and uh, at the same time also educate people. And what I mean by that is letting the fans, and you know, letting the viewers and listeners learn a little bit about you, uh, where you're at, where you're heading, and what you got going on. So cool. I know all the history, but let's uh, share Tell us uh, your football journey, where it started, what made you start, and what, you know, basically the ABCs. Yeah, no, so I was uh, I was fortunate back in, uh, as you said, uh, you went to Maryland, I went to Kansas, neither of us made it to Harvard. So uh, <laughs> I ended up going to the University of Kansas, and the cool thing was back then is, this is early 90s, uh, sports management was new. Like, that was not something that we see now. You can get it at almost every university or college. Sports management was this new concept of like, let's offer a, a opportunity to grow in, in sports business, not just business business. And I thought, well, that's great because, you know, I played a lot of sports, but I was never good enough to play to the collegiate level. And I thought this sounds like the perfect degree. So the cool thing as I fast forward is I volunteered at the athletic department at the University of Kansas through college just to get to know people networking, not realizing what it might end up being. And uh, the Kansas City Chiefs called a guy named Terry Bradway, who went on to become the Jets GM. Uh, he called when I was at my mom's good house. Man, and, good, good yeah, man, no, yeah he's good well. people. Very good dude. Um, he called and I was at my mom's house and he's like, hey, uh, we've got an internship in scouting. And the only reason he got my number is because I did all that volunteering, right? So it was fortunate for me, really blessed on that. Um, he's like, we got an internship in scouting. I wonder if you want to come come talk about it. I'm like, Kansas City Chiefs calling. Like, Joe Montana's in that locker room and Marcus <laughs> Allen's in that locker room and Derek Thomas and Neil Smith and yeah. Dale. I mean, they were loaded with players. And a cool side note was uh, that same week, I had a final interview with the Kansas City Royals in an internship. And so I told Terry on the phone, I'm like, Terry, I, 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 yes, I'd love to. I just can't come Wednesday because I've got an internship with the Royals that I'm interviewing for. And he's like, well, how about tomorrow morning? I'm like, got it. I'll be in the car. I'll drive to Kansas City and go interview. So I interview with Terry sit there, I think, meet some people within the organization. And about two hours later, he's like, do you want the internship? I'm like, pinching myself like, yes, sir. Yeah. I called the Royals and told them I took an internship with the Chiefs. And the amazing part there is that was the year baseball went on strike. So I'd have lost my internship at the Royals anyway. So uh, it worked out good. So I started with the Kansas City Chiefs and I was like that GA kind of thing, right? I was login tapes and this is old school like vhs tapes and yeah. <laughs> and and what happened was back then uh some of our scouts still wrote out their reports and then other scouts kind of were doing them on computer but we couldn't interface at all right so the best thing that ever happened to me was that because every night i had to take home a stack of like college scouting reports and i had to highlight them in yellow or blue good and bad and then i'd go into the main system and i'd type in the notes so i learned scout speak uh from our scouts, our veteran scouts that we had within the organization and uh, spent a year and a half with the Kansas City Chiefs and uh, was offered, you know, I think I made Big Daddy over those 18 months, I think I made at least $7,000 over those 18 months. So uh, really raking in some cash and a job opened up in Tampa Bay. Um, and I heard about it through the grapevine and it was an actual real job paying $25,000 with benefits. And so I flew down to Tampa and interviewed uh, with Jerry Angelo who obviously went on to become the GM of the Bears and Rich yeah. McKay, who at that time was our GM. And, um, you know, I took it. I was like, this is a full-time job. I got to take it. So I left Kansas City. We went six and 10, six dash 10 to people that really know the history of the Bucks, uh, because early in the season, we had Sam Weish was the head coach and we had won a game by the skin of our teeth. And Sam was, he was joking around with the media. He's like, hey, we're four dash two. Well, we went, you know, ended up being the headline at the end of the year was 6-10, Sam Weish fired, right? So, yeah. um, and then Kansas City Chiefs, Big Daddy, went 13-3. and three, And I'm like, the number one seed in the AFC, I'm like, I'm the dumbest 23-year-old you've ever met, you know? <laughs> and so I go and, and uh, we stay there and, and we get fortunate to hire Coach Dungy. Uh, we'd already had Warren Sapp and Derek Brooks there. John Lynch was already there. 
Uh, Trent Dilfer was the quarterback. Eric Rett was the running back. And then we drafted Rondé Barber and Mike Allstott and Warwick Dunn. And you just started drafting really great players, signed yeah. Simeon Rice. And, and uh, I started working my way up the, the ladder. I became a pro personnel assistant. Then I became a pro scout. And then I became the coordinator of pro scouting. And then uh, we just never advanced far enough for the owner's mind in the playoffs. And uh, th- uh, they made a decision to fire Coach Dungey. And then they also made a decision to trade for John Gruden. And in 2002, John comes in. I uh, become the director of pro scouting. And uh, he comes in and we recruit and sign an entire new offense. Our defense was great under Rod. Mar- uh, well, Rod Marinelli was there as the defensive line coach. It was, you know, it was, we had Lovey Smith there for a while. We had Mike Tomlin there, Raheem Morris. I mean, it was a special staff. And then obviously Monty Kiffin was the defense coordinator. But uh, John came in and changed everything on offense and made it very uh, different, right? I, I think the cool thing about my career is I've worked for Tony Dungy and I've worked for John Gruden. They could not be more different people, but they both mm-hmm. found ways to win, right, in a different way. And uh, that was cool. So I worked my way through the organization. And uh, in 2009, uh, the Bucks uh, let go of Bruce Allen. Uh, and hired me as the general manager of the Bucks. So I spent 19 years with the organization, five years as a GM, and we didn't win enough. We lost uh, too many games on the field and off the field uh, with uh, some of our key players and disappointing. And uh, so I ended up, my career in football was over 20 years in the scouting world. Uh, when I was GM, I also negotiated contracts and kind of handled all that stuff. So it was busy, Big Daddy, and a lot of, a, a lot of, uh, great memories uh, through the NFL. And then after that, if I just want to keep rambling, it's up to you, <laughs> but, uh, oh, go ahead, pull it all. We yeah, want so, no. Yeah. We, so after that, a uh, good friend of mine, Adam Schefter, who I'm sure anybody football wise knows who Adam is. He, uh, he came, he called me or no, yeah, six he, million followers. On Twitter. He, I know. Right. It's incredible. Adam lives right. We live near each other. So we, uh, we connect. Yeah, he's a good, good man. And um, he called me about two weeks after everything. He's like, Mark, you should do television. Like, I want you to, I want you to come to ESPN. I want you to see if, you know, if this might be a good fit for you. So I flew out to Bristol or I flew, I flew into Hartford and drove out to Bristol yep. and did a couple mock opportunities and uh, got hired on by ESPN and spent uh, five years with ESPN talking about football and and, and I always kind of the cool thing about television, Big Daddy, I always feel like is they never ask you like the easy questions, right? It's not like, hey, how do you feel after a game when you win by 20 points? Like no one ever asked me that. You know? <laughs> it's always like, oh, what would you do? Would you draft Michael Sam? You know, the player that came out was uh, openly gay before the draft. What would, how would you handle that as a GM? Or, hey, how do you fire a head coach? And, and how do you find a new coach? Or you've got to make a contract decision. Why would you do that? So the cool thing about television and radio, too, is that it's always – putting your GM hat back on thinking like, okay, if I was in that situation, how would I handle it? And so to me, that's been rewarding in terms of what television and radio brings. So I did that. Um, Currently I still do television. I I do a show called stadium sports based out of Chicago. Uh, I do a weekly show with them inside the league, still do NFL radio uh, channel 88, Uh, do a show with Bruce Murray, Uh, do other shows with other cool hosts on there and just talk football. And, uh, and then I, I, I have it on all the time. It's funny. I got the uh, serious on, and you know, today I was listening to Bob Papa and Charlie Weiss, and uh, you know, so I go through that whole, you know, Pat Kerwin and I go back since I've been high school. Wow. And this, you know, the '80s, and uh, Pat actually recruited my brother to Hofstra University, and my brother owes uh, Pat a few. Uh, few helps you know now my brother's with the bills you know as a db coach but uh mm-hmm. that's been kind of his mentor the whole one of them uh his whole way since he left college that's cool yeah pat's really good to me too um you know he was at the bucks when the bucks first became the bucks right he was already part of that organization i used to make fun of him that he was the one that told Bo Jackson to come and make the visit. It was going to be perfectly fine for his career. <laughs> and Bo's, Bo's still mad about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and whoever did that within the organization that told him, yeah, get on that plane and come visit us. And it became uh, the, the reason why Bo went to baseball for a while. But, um, yeah, Sirius XM NFL radio is a lot of fun. And it's, it's cool because you're interacting with fans. It's not just a one-way, you know, there's no interaction. It's, it's, it's not just a talk show. It's actual engagement. Yeah. So now – 
you're at a new company, X10. Let's talk about that. Yeah, uh, so X10 is a company that f reached out to me about four or five years ago now, Big Daddy. Mm -hmm. And it was a concept that I kind of understood. So basically the, the, the elevator pitch, the one minute pitch is, uh, I work for a company now that what we do is we invest in the future performance of an athlete. So uh, we work with uh, baseball and football players currently. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we go out and watch, I watch, I handle the football side, uh, a guy named Hal Morris, who played a long time in, in Major League Baseball as, as part, and Randy Newsom are, are actually head up the, uh, the baseball side. I've got Brad Hopkins on my team, the former player for the Titans, yeah. Titans yep, and, and a guy named Mikhail Allen on the football team as well. And what I do is I go out and I watch tape on guys that are in their rookie or second year or third year in the NFL. And... So my big belief is the more money you have in a war chest, the better decisions you make. And, and it's also kind of trying to help them understand the diversify some risk as a player takes. And so basically what it is, is we give them money today and it's not a loan. It's, it's not debt. It's, it's two, three, four, five million dollars today. The goal is that they will take that money and invest in their bodies and invest in their retirement earlier. Because as we all know, compounding interest is, as some people call it, the eighth wonder of the world. That's how people are getting so rich and wealthy is because they just have money that keeps growing. Mm -hmm. And so the sooner a player can start putting money to work, the more money that can grow into. And then what we do is we buy part of whatever their future earnings may be. So we give them guaranteed money today for non-guaranteed money tomorrow of anywhere between like 10 or 15 percent of their future earnings. And so, you know, if everything works out, uh, you know, the player hopefully has more leverage. Uh, the agent has a better platform to be more strong with the club and kind of hopefully negotiate a stronger deal. And quite frankly, if something goes really wrong in a player's career, he's going to have a couple more million dollars and he doesn't owe us the money back. It's a, it's a risk that we pay, take with players. And then we're alongside the team, kind of like, uh, I'd say, board of advisors. We're not their agent. We're not their financial advisor or marketing or anything like that. But we are a, a part of the board of directors. And if guys want performance reviews, I'll write them for them. Like if they want to say, how did I do in last week's game? I'll send you a report. I'll watch your tape. I'll send you a report from a GM's perspective and say, here's what you did well and here's what you need to work on. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a, a way just to be aligned with the player uh, so that he has as much success as he possibly can. So how do you select the player? Yeah, right. Good. Yeah, that's a, and, you know, uh, I was thinking about that as I, I was doing my research. So how do you select the player that you want to work with? Yeah, so it's 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 a process where uh, I'll watch tape on all the guys coming in the National Football League. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have a chance, an opportunity to meet a lot of these guys before they make it in the league. I do a lot of interview prep for these players as they're getting into uh, heading to the Senior Bowl, heading to the Combine, uh, you know, going to performance gyms or things like that. I meet with a lot of these guys, about 100 guys a year. I sit down with face to face and just kind of get to know them and understand their story and help them present themselves the best way they can when they're in front of a club. And that allows me to meet a bunch of, like I said, a, a bunch of young men. And then I kind of watch those same young guys and other players as they enter the league. And, you know, it's a little different. Like if I was doing it before they got in the league, it's kind of like being a gym and you're drafting a team. Once you get to see them play, it's, it's weird, Big Daddy. You've seen it before. I mean, you'll see a 22 year old go out there on the field and he holds his own and you'll see a 22 year old out there go on the field and you're like, Oh, as a bust. I mean, I can, I can think of it as fast as I remember the first practice. I had a third round player that we drafted one year and he went out to the rookie mini camp and his eyes bugged out of his head and cause he got burnt on a play. And I'm like, Oh no. And I went over to coach Morris at the time, Raheem uh, and said, that's not good. And he said, you saw that too. And I'm like, yeah, his eyes are like, he's a bust. Like it was that fast, like, oh, we're in deep trouble here. Like this, this guy, it's too big for him. And so yeah. the, the cool thing for me is I watch the tape on these guys in their rookie year or second year or whenever they get a chance to play. And I write a report on them, right? I write it just like I would if I was evaluating to sign them to the Jets. Um, and, I, and, I, and I put in there, like, how, do I, how long do I think he could play? And what's his skill set? And, you know, you know, tell me just, you know, everything about why I think he has a chance to be a good earner or an elite earner in the National Football League. And I put a grade on them. 
And then we have a whole quant team that's on the other side of, of X10, and they've got this whole formula with all these different me metrics, you know, what, what round were you drafted, what position do you play, what different positions do you play, how many snaps do you play by this point in your career, what's your age, obviously, um, you know, the PFF grade, all those kind of things go into it. And we do a pricing call, and then we see if, does it mirror? Does, does what I see match what the, what the math says? And then we go and we, you know, we'll, we'll meet an agent because I know a lot of agents as, as you do too, uh, <laughs> sit there, talk to them. And then a lot of times it'll go to the financial advisor and I'll explain the concept to them and talk to the financial advisor. Sometimes it goes to the CPA for the tax ramifications. How does it work? And, and then we go and we present an offer, uh, to their team and then to the player and, uh, see if a guy wants to join X10 and be part of what we're doing. And again, uh, you know, the cool thing, it's math because we cap everything that a player would ever have to pay back. And so even a financial advisor can look at it and go, OK, so if you give me two million and his cap is 40 million, so he's got to pay back six over time. That means if I take this two million today and I get a six percent return, this will cost him nothing, actually, over time. And yet if if, if he ends up making 20 million dollars, then it's really good he did this because he got to put a million dollars to work earlier. So it's it's fair. And I think that's the cool thing about it is I know that. I think that when we do a deal with the player, if he has discipline in terms of money, in terms of like investing in himself and, and investing in the bank, not the bank, but in investments, um, he can't lose. He, he doesn't lose in what we do. So a lot of guys look at like, uh, you've been in the insurance world for a long time, right? It's not insurance because we're paying the player. He's not paying us unless he has success. And that's the cool part about it is that he's got to really have great success for us to do well as, as an organization as well. And it's funny because what you just explained is what I do with the college kid when they're coming in. All right, listen, everyone's my guy's going to be a first rounder and I've gotten that for 30 some years and I've insured guys that never got drafted. And then the guy that uh, and I always use this example. I'll never forget Roddy White was coming out. Mm hmm. And I got in an argument with the underwriter because they were telling me that he's probably a third round pick or less. And I'm like, I don't know where you're getting your information, but I have clients that are GM <laughs> and they're telling me that this guy's a first rounder. So like we were going back and forth and just to get like a million dollar coverage on the guy was like pulling teeth. Then all of a sudden the guy that they were all gung ho about, which I won't name, doesn't even get drafted and they were willing to give him whatever he wanted. So I'm like, I'm All right, explain this to me, you know, explain it to me. I'm not the smartest guy, but just tell me and give me an answer why you came up with this. And it was kind of like, well, you know, we go by, I'm, I'm like, yeah, you're going by the guy that works in a deli that reads, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, reads a, a story magazine. So it just doesn't work that way. But, you know, you, you, you sit there and you, you know, sometimes you have to be honest and truthfully, brutally honest, where you say, okay, this is what I can do. This is how we do it. Uh, you know, then there's the premiums and all that, and we work all through that. And, and you're investing in your future, one. And two, it allows you to sleep at night. God forbid mm -hmm. something happens. That's it. That's exactly. And that's what I tell, I tell these players all the time. We're not exclu mutually exclusive from disability policies or anything like that. In fact, if you want to take some of this money and buy that disability policy, you, you're, not only are we giving you a couple million dollars, but you can go buy some more insurance too. So you know, you know what? If you want to go for it and go to free agency and, and experience what it's like to have 31 other clubs bid on you, go for it. And because that's how you earn the most money. I mean, that's it's what Darrell Rivas did his entire life, right? He fully betted yeah. on himself and said, you know what? I'm not taking that offer. I'm not doing this. I'm going to bet on myself. I'm going to, I'm going to go out there and go get paid what I'm worth. And that's how Rivas made so much money because he was great at that. And uh, that's what we look at it as the same thing is we're saying, hey, look, if you want to buy disability, if you want to buy, you know, whatever type of insurance product you want, do it. By all means, if you're going to sleep better at night, like your point, uh, then great. You're not only going to have a couple million dollars, you're also going to have some other money in case something really bad goes happens. And that's way, get yourself prepared to go for it and go get paid what you're worth. Because you see it all the time, right? We, you look at Xavier Howard and he did a deal. You know, whatever it was, 18 months ago and, you know, th four months ago, he's like, I hate my deal. Yeah. You just did a deal because he didn't go all the way and, and kind of see what the whole world would think of him. And, and there's there's you see that from time to time, because, look, let's be honest with the NFL. It's hard, right? 
if a player's making $10 million and he's playing like a $5 million player, the club's going to come to him and go, hey, look, you got to take a pay cut or we're going to have to let you go, right? If a $10 million player is playing like a $20 million play, player, the club's like, hey, you're doing a great job. Good job, buddy. Hang in there. You know, we'll talk about it down the road, right? So, I mean, the player's always at this, this level of like, they'll – always keep me when I'm overperforming, but when I start to underperform, they're always going to use it as leverage. And so therefore, uh, I'm a big believer now being on the player side of how do you increase your guarantees? How do you create better structure? How do you, you know, push money to the front three years? And to me, a lot of that's having that confidence that if the downside's protected, the upside I can go get. That's, that's yeah. the co concept we believe in. So briefly, you've answered my next two questions, but I will I'll, we'll get the Reader's Digest version. Sure. You know, um, why would a player do X10? And then the other one is, what do you like the most about X10? Okay. So I think a player would do X10 in different situations for every player. I think the, the to call it what it is, uh, we all know like the Patriots don't love to pay their players, right? I mean, let's be honest. The Bengals have not had a history of saying, hey, let's go reward our guys early and pay them premiums. That's just not them. But there are other organizations that do do that. But mm -hmm. so, you know, club p organizations that have a history that don't do deals early or below market deals. That's a place where I think a player's like, look, I'm going to probably have to play this thing out at least four years. I might get a tag. And that's three years from now. And that's a long time. And that's a lot of play. It's, it's you know, it's why agents don't love the franchise tag, even though it's, fully guaranteed money because everybody's like the risk is real in the national football league every week. You don't know. I think a player also does X 10. If, if they, if they can see the math behind it, meaning, Oh, so if I do put $1.5 million away and my financial advisor does get me a 6% return, then I know that in 20 years when I open it up and I'm 45, that I'm going to have six to $12 million more than what I have today okay, I know that I'm starting to be on my way for generation wealth. And if your career goes the way we hope it does, you're going to add to that. So that way, by the time you are 45, you're going to have generational wealth, which is what we want these guys to do. Because the statistics are still so bad out there in terms of how many players end up broke after they play. Mm -hmm. And so I think another player that the reason why they do it is, you know, they, they understand that they want to make sure that they're, they're, they're comfortable when they're 45 and that they know they've got some money stashed away no matter what. And I think the third reason why a guy does it is because he does have a chip on his shoulder and he does want to prove, hey, look, I want to go for it, but I, I, I want to be smart about it. And so I'm going to take this to because I've, I've got some guaranteed money now for sure because I want to I want to see what the brass ring looks like. And and those are three different reasons because uh, one's situational, what club you might be with or who's negotiating the deals. The second is Obviously, there's the risk of every day, the injury. And, and, you know, and then I think the third is just the, the fact that, you know, they want to, like I said, they want to bet on themselves and, and, and see what they can be worth. I think the, the cool thing for me is uh, I love this job because I'm building a football team, Big Daddy. I uh, got, you know. You know how. So you know yeah, how. Yeah, but I don't, I don't have to have, you know, a corner, a corner, safety, safety, a middle linebacker. I can have. 22 offensive linemen and I'm happy. Right. I mean, that's just, so it's, it's still building a team. Uh, you know, we've, we've invested over $200 million in athletes already uh, in baseball and football, and it's building that team and, and, and really being a resource for them if they want it in any capacity, you know, during COVID, you know, we had one of our players like, I can't find a, a, a bench, a bench set anywhere, barbells and bench, like, find one. And so one of our guys, Brad Hopkins, he got out there and he's like, I've sent it to you. I found it, sent it to your house and boom, went to his house. Right. And so we're just, we're just there to help whenever a player needs a resource or wants to hear something. Cause the agents are good. The financial advisors are good, but uh, you know, that's the reason why Russell Wilson has such a big team around him. Right. Cause he's trying to do everything as a business. And we really try to help these young men understand that they're a business and they need to run it like a business instead of just like the mindset of like, hey, I'm just going to go ball out and get paid. Well, that's not a business. It's like, I'm going to go and start a gas station and hope it works. Okay, well, there's a lot of things that go into getting into a gas station going off the ground. It's, it's a lot of work. And if you want some experience from being there and done that before, hire the agent. That's great. Hire the marketing guy. That's great. But, you know, let's, let's make sure you hire research and development, too. And let's make sure you hire nutritionists, too. And let's make sure you hire all the different pieces you should get. 
I, I totally understand the whole concept because uh, being in the insurance business, we've had that concept all along. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is, look, you know, you're supposed to not worry about your first contract, worry about getting to your second contract, making sure that you protect what, you know, uh, I love when financial guys say, hey, we're here to make you rich. No, you're not here to make anyone rich. You're supposed to say, I'm here to keep you wealthy, mm -hmm. not rich. And let's worry about getting to the next contract. And then where do I fall into this whole thing? And there's always conflict there because, you know, my, uh, I, and you know me a long time, I guess my presence takes <laughs> a lot of uh, <laughs> getting used to. And, and, and look, I always joke around. I said, look, you know what? I make pizza. I don't try to do donuts or Chinese food or anything. I stick in my, stay in my lane. And, you know, as long as you have a team around you working, that is so much better than just being an individual and trying to do it all yourself. You know, that's one. And two, you know, I get throughout the years, I've had interviews where, hey, uh, you know, my mom is going to be my financial advisor and she's going to oversee everything and this and that. And I have no issue with that whatsoever. But I'll say to the player, let me ask you this. If your mom doesn't get you that six or seven or let's just use a conservative three percent and she loses you a million bucks, are you going to fire her? <laughs> you, can you do right. that? And, you know, the look that you get when you say that, they're like, wow, I never took I never thought of it that way. Well, look, I'm not saying your mom's not qualified, but if she's not licensed like I am and I'm not I don't invest anyone's money. But how can you really allow that? You know, like, doesn't make sense. You know, it's it's great to make a lot of money, but you have to be able to have it for later on down the road. Like you said, when you're 45, 50 years old, hey, if you're pulling out, whatever, two, 300,000 a year, tax-free or whatever it is, however it's worked out to be, great. You're ahead of 80% of players. Yes. Like, like you said, I've seen guys that, had all the money in the world and had nothing, have nothing because they didn't plan. They didn't have the right people around them. Exactly. They didn't have, you know, you, 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 you're the quarterback or you're the GM. Well, listen, the GM is the person you go to for the answers to get, um, get a, what do you call it? A, a non-personal answer, a non-personal resolution. That's what I used to I say to the, uh, a lot of these parents and to the players too. Like when I do the performance review, if you want one, it isn't going to be all, you know, cushy, love and happy. It's going to be cut to the chase. Like players just want honesty. They really do. And I, and I tell the guys that we partner with, like, if you go score three touchdowns, you're not going to get a text from me after the game going, great job, three touchdowns. Like you've got enough people in your life to do that for you. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be that. I'm your business partner. I, I'm here. If you got questions about your business, you're running, and, and, and if you and if I see something that's broken in your business right now, let's talk about it. We're working with an offensive lineman, one of our guys right now. And to me, he's overweight and he's moving slow footed and he wasn't like that his rookie year. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm just being candid with him. Like, you've got to you've got to trim up and you need to do some plot. You've got to start loosening up because you're th you're tight in your lowers and it's showing up on tape and you're still starting. But, you know, you know how it is, Big Daddy. I mean, we see coaching change a lot and we're seeing a lot more GM change than ever before, too. Yeah. Well, so, you know, that yeah. guy didn't draft you. That coach didn't pick you. You know, you're not as comfortable as you should be, you know, or you're too comfortable and you shouldn't be, I think is the right way. And we also, to your point also, you're right. Your first contract, the work's just starting once you get your first contract. And you know that, and I know that, right? <laughs> exactly. A lot of people around these kids think, oh, they've made it. No, they really haven't. You know, second round picks don't have as much money as people think. They just don't. Yes, it's money. And, and yes, to the average college kid or the average 20 year old or whatever, it's a lot of money mm -hmm. for the national football league to last you your life. Possibly it's not very much money at all. Yeah. And so we, I also encourage him, like, I want you to not only get to that second contract, we're here to try to help you earn that second contract and then go get a third. If you really want to, or if you're at the point where I, Hey, look, I'm 29 years old, I'm 30 years old, 31 years old. I want to walk away cause I'm healthy. Great. If that's what you want to do, you know, because you've, you've, to your point, you've planned where you can. And instead of saying, oh, I got to play one more year because I have to have them, you know, I didn't plan right. So now I don't have that money. And we also remind our guys that, you know, you can invest, like I said, in your body. Because how many times have you ran into the 29 year old who said, oh, I wish I'd have done that when I was 23? 
Well, I, 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 if it was a hundred thousand dollars, I'd have about a hundred million. <laughs> yeah. And so we tell these guys, like, go talk to the veteran in your locker room, ask them what they're doing, because now you've got two more million dollars, three more million dollars. Go do that. Go hire the nutritionist. Get the hyperbaric chamber if you really think that's good for you. Go get this acupuncture therapy if you think that's important, because he's done it and he's still playing. And he's like, yeah, I, I did. I started this three years ago. It's helped a lot, you know, because your body's not 22 and 23 anymore. Now it's 28. And it's taken. <sighs> 5,000 more hits at an incredible speed and power. Uh, it's hard. It's, it, and that's the other thing people don't realize also is it is so hard to play at the national football league level. It is, you know, a guy that goes to a camp and gets cut should never feel embarrassed because he got to a camp in the national football league. Cause it's so hard to get that far because it's such a violent and physical game that if you're ever on the sideline and you can see it from the sideline, you've seen one, I've seen them too. Oof, when they bring it, it's crazy. And they got to get back up and go get it again. It, it's, it's, it, but that's what makes the game so uh, awesome to watch. And just like last night, the last play of the game with A.J. Green didn't get the hand signal yeah, yeah. from Kyler Murray. Everybody's like, oh, but it's just – and it's a game of that. It's just like they might have won. I don't know. But that's what makes the game so fun to watch is uh, the outcomes are always unpredictable. I tell people all the time, um, you can't imagine what a guy plays on a Sunday and then has to play on a Thursday. Mm. Their body usually doesn't come back until Thursday. Mm -hmm. I always, I'm like, man, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, you got to give uh, A for effort and A plus for credit for getting up and doing it four days later. You know, and you know, like you said, you've been there, you've seen it. I, I've seen some collisions where you're like, how does the guy even get up? You know, and uh, but uh, kudos to them. And, you know, they uh, they're doing what they love and they get paid handsomely in some in some instances. And, uh, you know, it's fun to watch. It is. And I think the, the, the really good thing for the players going forward now is, you know, the cap's going to be at 208 next year. I'm certain it's going to be the max cap for these players. So that's a huge increase from this year. And I think the next year it's going to be the 230s. And so in one or two years from now, we're going to see really strong contracts and, and base salaries are going up as well for the rookies or the, you know, the guys that make it two or three years, but now they're going to be, you know, by the time the CBA is up, guys are going to be making over a million dollars as a rookie. And that's at least if they can if they can surround themselves with the right people, it can be life changing money. Even if you make it two and a half, three years, it can at least give you a great stepping stone because when we talk about that, like you just said, a lot of these guys get to play into the thirties if they're lucky and they got 50 more years to live. That's a long, long time. And, uh, and a lot of these guys, this is all they've ever known is football. And so we also work with them when they transition out, uh, with our network again, if they want the help is what, and, and as they're playing, we kind of find out what their interests are. And then we start to introduce them to people and, and try to help them like, okay, now that you want to walk away, remember all these people we've met along the way, Let's let's reintroduce ourselves there because let's transition because that's a really awful time for an NFL player is transitioning away from the game. It's so hard because they've never at that point, they've never been told they weren't good enough. And now they're sitting there looking at it going, I don't know what else to do with my life. And, you know, usually I'm gone during the season. Now I'm home all the time and I've got three children somehow and a wife. And I'm like, I don't have to. And now I got to manage all this, too. And so it's a very difficult transition. And we are proud that we can help them in that transition as well. I'll tell you, the guy that I watched do all that and, and take it to another level and taught me a ton of stuff was Ronnie Lott. The ultimate consummate pro on and off the field. And I used to laugh. I would drive around with him and the old Motorola flip phones, the gray ones yeah. back in the day, I never saw anyone with more batteries in his briefcase than him. He would have like 10 to 12 of those things <laughs> just ready to take it off, but the new one all the time on the phone, on the phone, communicating, meeting this one, that one. And, and I, I, like I said, not only did I drive around with him a lot, I learned a lot from him by watching him, how he handled business, how he communicated with people and how he was able to draw people in. Obviously he was running a lot, but still, you have to have that gift to be able to express yourself, tell people what you want, who you are, what you're looking to do, and everything so on 
from A to Z. He would go through, and I was like, and I would be sitting there, wow, this is a great education I'm getting, you know, as I'm uh, running around with, uh, you know, you got a trophy named after him now, so uh, an award. I'm like saying HOF already, but uh, yeah, he t- he was uh, the the guy that I learned quite a bit from, and and watched him take his game. Uh, there's several others, but he was really the first one that I saw in my young age back then when uh, he was just walking away from the game. Yeah, it's so, interesting you tell that story because uh, one of our two founders of X10 is David Byrne, and David and Ronnie are business. They've done business together, and David. Uh, you know, he's u- uber um, successful uh, as a man. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he, and he was able to invite Ronnie Lott into opportunities out there in, in San Francisco. And Ronnie was, as, he's, as David always says, Ronnie was very dialed into understanding a lot of big picture, not just a football player, but that there is a business and I can do some other things and I can, you know, diversify some of these different things and look into opportunities. And so I've, I've never had a chance to really meet Ronnie Lott, but I've heard the stories of how he was very tied into making sure that he's being a businessman. And uh, you're, you just confirmed all that with, uh, with the cell phone guns and all those extra chargers, which is it's crazy. Uh, yeah, there's a, a story that uh, we'd have to, I'd have to tell you off air that uh, it had to do with Kansas City, and you'll laugh your ass off because it really explains and shows – who he is and how he dealt with business and people, but I'll share that with you off air. Right. So, be good. so, okay, here's the fun part. Now I'm going to hand you the mic and uh, you get to ask me whatever you feel you want to ask. You want to know. You wanna find out, get, you may yeah. not know about me. Find, you know? find out the secrets of Big Daddy. So <laughs> I think my biggest question is, you know, and I know the NFL – is a big, I don't know if fraternity is the right word, but it's certainly a hard nut to crack, right? You, once you get in, you can get in. Yeah. But it's very hard. There's people all the time that want to get a job in the National Football League or want to be an agent, but they can't figure out how to do it. They want to be this. They, they can't. But how did you break bread and become known by everybody? Like, how did you make your first entry into the NFL? What was that experience like? And, and then – What's your drive that made you become like when you walk in, everybody's like, hey, big day, you're like Norm, right? Everybody knows who you are. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, tell me your drive, what, what drove to do that, and also tell me how you broke into the league. Well, uh, it's funny. Um, I grew up in Long Island when the Jets were in Hempstead in Long Island. One of my friends was uh, the equipment manager there, Billy Hampton. And uh, bless his soul, he's up there watching. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. Well, the whole Hampton family, I've known them. They were all equipment managers. And then, you know, they went from Billy went to the league and then one and then he ended up at the Cleveland Browns and then he went to Under Armour and whatnot. But those guys, uh, I grew up with them. So that kind of made, you know, I was around football and uh, and I was meeting people and whatnot. Then I ended up moving to Pittsburgh, and my college roommate was Neil O'Donnell, who was the coach. So, <laughs> How did you know Neil, though? How did that? He was my roommate in Maryland. We played football together. Oh, okay, so, he's your roommate in Maryland. I got you. Yep. So, uh, so I ended up going to Pittsburgh, and, uh, you know, both of us are single, and we're sharing an apartment. And here I am. I was like kind of – and we joke around about it still. I, I tell people, well, I was Neil's Cato Caitlin. You know, <laughs> I'd drive around, I'd go here, I'd go there. And in that whole process, here I am now going down to Three River Stadium and being as big as I am, I would walk in there like everyone would thought I was a player. So yeah. it was like, oh, here comes Big Daddy, and I'd walk in. And, and if you saw Marvin Lewis, he would say to you, you know, here I was thinking, man, who's that guy? Because it's a pretty big dude, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the whole time they thought I was on the team because wow. I was spending a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am meeting, I'm meeting Mr. Rooney. I'm meeting this one, Tom Donahoe, you know, Bill Cower gets hired. And I was there when he got hired. So I know uh, Bill from day one. And then, um, and the funniest thing is, I don't get my start in football. I get my start in hockey. Oh. And how this happens is 
Jim Sweeney, who we all know from back in the pit days and played uh, in the league for about 15, 16 years, he was a pit guy with Marino. So Jim, being at the Jets, said to me, hey, you're going to Pittsburgh. When you get there, look this guy up, and, and he'll take care of you. All right. So I meet him, and uh, the guy says, hey, so Big Daddy, you just got here. Uh, meet me. We're going to go to a softball game. And I'm like, oh, softball game? I'm like, I just drove from New York, and that's like the last thing I want to do. But okay. Long story short, we go to watch this game, and he introduces me. He goes, oh, I need you to meet my friend. His name is Mario. I walk over and wait a minute, that's Mario Lemieux, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> well, hi, Mario, how you doing? <laughs> so, here I am, I get thrown into this world of meeting the greatest hockey player of all time. And I started in the insurance business in hockey because okay. here I was in Pittsburgh and I'm now with the king of the city and going to games and I meet his agents and, you know, I start working with his agents. I mean, it was like a whole drawn out story, but then I leave Pittsburgh and I had met so many people. So then I was able to uh, take those relationships and keep them and formulate even greater relationships because it would be like, uh, you know, I meet, uh, you know, I knew Shiano. So mm -hmm. Greg, introduces me he tries to introduce me to you when i already knew you you know so it's kind of like yes, that. exactly you know it's like some people know you and then some people know of you yeah. so that's really how i've gone and then i always made it a point to brand myself or market myself and i was at every i mean how many times we've run into each other on a field and either before the game or after or wherever it was or the senior bowl or the Oops, combine, Super or bowl, Super combine Bowls, the draft, everyone. We, we were all in the same dances and, and I made it a point to say, if I'm going to really be this guy, I have to make sure that one, everyone knows why I'm here and mm -hmm. two, what I do and three, to be at everything I could be at like a where's Waldo and let everyone know that, Hey, yeah, I'm big daddy, but, I'm Big Daddy. This is I do insurance for a living. This is what I do. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it for thirty something years now, and and that's the thing that um, led me to get these relationships. And and they the relationships go all the way up to Roger. You know, it's funny. Roger, will, uh, I'll say he'll introduce me to some people, and I'll say, oh, you know, my name is Rich Salgado. He's like, dude, would you stop? Yeah. He goes, what's Big Daddy? You know, and I'm like. You know, I don't know what to say because yeah, it's the commissioner. <laughs> the commissioner is telling you, telling these people who you don't know. Oh, this is Big Daddy. So, all right, so it just kind of sticks, and you know, you don't have to know my real name, and ninety percent of the world doesn't, but everyone knows who Big Daddy is. So it's like, and then you know, you take the opportunities that come in front that that are put in front of you. Mm -hmm. You know, you see this uh, helmet back here. It says Big Daddy. I mean, uh. Fox and Friends. Yep. I didn't go to school for communications or TV or any of that, but I got the opportunity. Someone gave me a mic and now I'm out interviewing people, you know, and I've been doing the Super Bowl correspondent thing with Fox for over since 2007. And then that led, that led to this podcast. So it, it's just all these things. It's about taking advantage of the opportunity that's put forth in front of you and doing what you say you can do and be real. And I think that's what allows me to have the relationships that I have that I can get people like yourself and other people on the phone and say, Hey, I'm doing this show. Be my guest. Let's promote what you're doing and let's laugh and have fun. And I listen, if you saw the other 50 other podcast uh, tapings, you would see some names in there that you're like, you know, everyone was blown away. I got Andy Reid the week of the Super Bowl. That's awesome. You know, I'm not blown away because I know Andy for 20 some years, 30 yeah. years. You know, hey, Andy, do me, Big Daddy, tell me where and when. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, that's the answer. And, and, you know, I'm not done yet. I've got a couple of things that I'll share with you, but it's about opportunity. You know, the opportunities come to you and you have to be selective. You can't, you know, pick a whole, uh, you know, if you get a dozen eggs, that doesn't mean you have to eat all a dozen. You know, you got to look at it and, and and be smart about it. So that's mm 
that's where I've really, uh, in the last couple of years, where I've really elevated a lot of things. Yeah, I think that you're right. And I think, quite frankly, in the gambling world, there's a lot more things that are still coming down probably your way in the possibilities and just, just because the gaming's become such a big part of it too. And uh, you, got, you do, you have to be selective in terms of what you want to put yourself into because it is your reputation that's on the line. And so yeah. if you commit to something and you can only, only go halfway, that's not who you are and that's not who you're known as. And uh, that's that's really that's really cool because I'm trying to think when I first met you met you but I I, I couldn't even tell you when it was because it just feels like you've always been there right and, and to your point because you've been at football games you've been at events you've been at charity events I've seen you at it's just you've done a great job of being there and and then being warm when you're there and and I think that's the thing that's always uh, what I've always always struck with me is that it, it's always a, hey it's always a a term of endearment whenever you meet the next person. And, and I think that's something that everybody should steal from you. Well, well, thank you. I had someone say that to me actually yesterday. And he goes, if I could just intern for you, and this guy's older than me, or can I learn your formula? I'm like, I you could do whatever you want. I don't know what that formula is. I'm just being me, you know? Mm -hmm. I know how to be upfront, be honest, and tell you the truth. And, you know, it's black and white. There's no gray, you know? It's just because... Everyone else, and you know this from from years, there everyone wants to be a part of something that has to do with you, regardless of what that may be. Mm -hmm. you know, they always want some attachment. They want to get to meet somebody. They want to get to know this and that, and they're looking for you know information, whatever the case may be. And it, that's why I'm very selective, and now even more so than I used to be. So I'm I, uh, I'm a brand and I try to protect the brand. It's, it's brilliant. It's working well for you, Big Daddy. I'm glad <laughs> I get to be part of the brand this this this, this podcast, Big Man. That's awesome. Hey, listen. No, hey. So I want you to tell everybody. Thank you for those nice words. Tell everybody where they can find you on social media, where they can learn more about X10. Because you know our our my job is always to when there's a good thing to share it with people. Mm -hmm. And. It's up to everyone else to say, hey, Big Daddy, you were right. This thing is legit. I want to do it. Or, you know, it's not for me. But tell everybody where to find you and find your information. Yeah, so I think the Twitter-wise, I'm at Mark Dominic. Uh, it's D-O-M-I-N-I-K NFL. So at Mark Dominic NFL. Uh, I'm not a big Instagram guy. I should be. I probably need to be more in that world. Uh, I'm a tweeter of guys. If I tweet, it's going to be football. I don't t tell you what I had at Starbucks. That's that's not what I tweet. So <laughs> I'm not that, that, that kind of a Twitter guy, um, which is fine. Wh whatever you want to be. Uh, again, Stadium Sports. Uh, I have a chance to do Stadium Sports. You can find that. Uh, it's a show called Inside the League. It's usually on Comcast or Verizon, but it's a show coming out of Chicago. So it's just a weekly show. We just break bread with Lorenzo Alexander or you know, Jordan Palmer or whoever you know, Coach Fox is on there, John Fox. And so we just get to kind of do roundtable discussions about what's going on in the National Football League. It's a lot of fun. It's a it's a show once a week. Um, NFL radio, it's kind of hit or miss during the season uh, because during the season, it's hard for me with all the evaluations and stuff I'm doing. But off the season, I'm on every Friday with Bruce Murray from like 11 to 3 Eastern Standard Time. So you can catch me there. Or you might catch me filling in for other hosts. And the next 10, uh, we, we do have a website, x10capital.net or .com. I can't remember which it is. And, uh, you know, there's some information about what we do there uh, as, as, a, as a group of people. And, uh, you know, it's, you know I, I host uh, a, a call-in show every week on sports management worldwide with John Wooten, who I think the world of uh, as a man that's a pioneer in so many different ways and get to pick his brain as a, a mentor of mine. But also then we kind of help young people or really anybody who are trying to navigate their way to finding a career in sports. Uh, so Mr. Wooten and I do that every Wednesday night for an hour, and it's always a lot of fun. So I keep myself pretty busy. I got a lot of different things moving, um, but uh, I enjoy – I've always loved football, and I've been very fortunate. I've spent my whole life getting to do it, and that's been awesome. Well, listen, that's – I learned a little bit of uh, something about you today, and uh, I'm sure the uh, viewers and listeners have as well. So – I want to say, Mark, thank you so much for uh, joining me on Big Daddy and Friends. And uh, you're always welcome to come back whenever you want. And uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing you somewhere down the road. 
you know, it seems like everyone now sees everybody on a computer screen. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I will see you because it looks like everything's moving in the right direction. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in person. And uh, thanks for having me on. I think I made the top 100, so I'm fired up about that. Yeah, man, you're in. <laughs> so listen, for everyone out there, make sure you follow Mark Dominic. And uh, until next time on Big Daddy and Friends, we'll see everybody real soon. And uh, have a great weekend.